Welcome to the Rooted Healing Podcast, where we seek to deepen our kinship with the living world and with the great mystery that runs through us. This is a space where stories heal with words that weave us closer to our wild and daring natures, bringing together the expansive minds, topics, and ideas that help us heal, reimagine, and co-create the world we wish to thrive in. I talk about stories of regeneration because I think it comes from a kind of place of not really identifying with the word sustainability or conservation. These words that mean to continue as we are, but not to do much more, to sustain. And I think we're in a multi crises but one of them is our incapability to act. Hello, it's wonderful to have you here. We've been a little slow to release our podcast recently because we've been fully immersed in our soul medicine gathering, which was just incredible. It was truly an honour to create and be a part of such a deep, explorative, vulnerable, transformative space and journey for healing. So much so that we are mad enough to do it again (laughs) and really soon we're opening up the offering this April from the 5th to the 12th and repeating the same soul medicine programme because this healing work is now more than ever so deeply needed. We've had some really touching, beautiful feedback and I hope you don't mind me reading this piece of, well, it's it's poetry from one of our guests. It feels wrong to say guest actually because she's family now. So with permission from Elisa, this is what she wrote. This soul medicine retreat was definitely a powerful and transformative journey which took me to the unknown shore side of my inner self. It felt like embodying a new flesh, taming new sensations, embracing new forms on a constant discovery or rediscovery of sense and visions as if the world was unveiling itself for the first time before my eyes. It felt like the inner child dialogue was finally possible to establish and enable to reconnect the most anchored sensations within deep layers and tissues. An amazing vibration of light frequencies giving life to all the cells of my body. A new breath that gives courage and strength. The jungle played a huge role in that part, being a constant source of inspiration and infinite consolation. I felt an immediate connection with the place, soaking it in like a circus animal that is finally brought back to her natural habitat. Such a strong and powerful fauna and flora that envelops, protects, caresses, heals. The unknown suddenly became very familiar, vernacular. The people attending to this adventure rapidly evolved into family members, sharing fragments of life that collide, understand each other, marry, melt, rise, enrich each other. A complementary fragility, a familiar perfume that embalms and elates us, subtly clearing a secure path towards a new form of autonomy. A metamorphosis full of promises, tears, laughs, smiles and an utter rage for life that will remain etched in my heart and flesh for eternity. (laughs) Ah, Elisa, I love you. (laughs) I love every being who came to that gathering so much and I feel them holding me as we go on with our lives separated and just sharing, you know, in a WhatsApp group, some of our processes. And um, yeah, I may have been a space holder, but I shared into the group the some of the news I've been having and just been moving through the weeks since we were together and they have been incredible. Yeah, and I think I 
more than anyone I know, or maybe that's an exaggeration, but I, I, I sit in the uncomfortable questions around this type of work, around tourism in general, medicines, you know, working in, with integrity, safety, ethical practices, uh, the grey areas of appropriation, actually having implementable integration, you name it, I am constantly evaluating and checking in with my biases, deconstructing different approaches to this work and it's just so important to me and to the whole team that this work is safe, thoughtful, connected and invites deep reciprocity. And it feels a little weird for us at Rooted Healing to be promoting a gathering like this when a war has broken out and one that is close to home than the other recent and ongoing conflicts and oh, yeah it has been a crazy few weeks that's all I can say I don't usually share like this in these intros I usually dive straight in but I do feel called to say that myself and everyone around me has been swallowed by waves of harsh deep processes shocking news and personal struggles and one friend who I was speaking to took my analogy of, um, I said I, I felt like I was drowning amongst it all. And she said that it's more like one of those big waves that knocks you over and churns you around where you just have to hold your breath and trust that you will be pushed back out by the current at the right moment. I am also sitting in weekly grief circles with Nikki Harrison's apprenticeship you can listen to my interview with her, it's the first episode we released and it has been so nurturing to allow space for the grief to process, to share, to be vulnerable and to not just pretend that everything is okay. This toxic positivity can be a real thing, especially I must say in spiritual cliques and at the same time in the usual paradoxical nature we must carry on with the medicine and with the healing and the work that enables us to show up with more strength, resilience and sensitivity. Life is throwing us curveballs all the time and we need each other, we need to know how to hold space, how to share pain and love and joy without the masks that we so often feel that we have to wear. So I am honoring you in this moment and whatever you're feeling in your heart, whether it's numbness or pain or joy or anything in between, I am grateful for you to just welcome it all in in this moment and like we spoke about in the last episode with Carolina Kawan, just taking a moment to come into the body, notice how we are feeling, what we are feeling, and to simply say yes to it, to be kind to ourselves and to trust ourselves. So to bring some nourishment, lightness, some fresh perspective, I'd love to introduce you to this episode's guests, Joya Barrow and Lucy Jane, who are multi-award winning documentary directors, whose work has been broadcast by National Geographic, Guardian, Sky Atlantic, British Film Institute and many, many, many more. They are most notable for their craft of directing authentic human stories with impactful narratives focusing on climate justice, land and ocean regeneration and amplifying marginalised voices in the climate movement to use film as a tool for positive social and environmental change. The list of awards for their films is a small demonstration of the artistry, thoughtfulness and power their work resonates. Go and watch their films at therighttoroam.com and wherever else you can find them because we need to witness these stories that go beyond the typical mainstream media around the climate crisis that often leaves us feeling paralysis and despair. These are stories that can demonstrate and model grassroots change and impact in a really beautiful, emotive and real way. 
I don't know how old Joya and Lucy are, but they are young. (laughs) And it's really inspiring to follow their work and also see how they are amplifying younger voices who want to heal this world. It gives me hope. So I hope you enjoy this fun and light conversation between the three of us. Well, thank you both so much for being here on the Rooted Healing podcast. I've been following your work and watching your films and just really enjoying everything you're sharing online. I think you're powerful climate and community storytellers and it's wonderful to connect with you, learn more about all the work you do with The Right to Rome and yeah, dive into this conversation together. Could you ease us in to your work and world and how you are creating stories of regeneration and just doing it in such a beautiful way at such a young age it's really inspiring and why this type of storytelling is where you're placing your vision and hope and also if you have any reflections on how the land that you grew up on shaped this as well we both were respectively grew up in different parts of the UK um, in the countryside so Lucy grew up in Wales and I grew up in Dorset and we had pretty privileged upbringings in terms of just being surrounded by nature and finishing school being able to go to the woods or go swimming in the sea and when we arrived and went to university in London I think we both kind of came to terms with our upbringing and how unique it has had been and how it had truly shaped us. And as a result, the stories that we've gone on to tell are all about connection to the landscape and that kind of relationship and lifeblood and restorer, but then that nature can give us but then also the need for us to stand up and protect the place that we love so our films are about highlighting kind of local ecosystems environments and people championing protecting the land but then also that work has led us afar to South America, we both speak Spanish and we traveled for nine months there. And through those nine months, volunteering and working, we came across many places and people and lots of seeds were planted. And this trip was about five years ago. And so that trip was kind of the foundation for a huge education around coastal communities who are being affected by climate change, coral degradation, the lack of representation of um, diverse role models in the surf industry on a global platform. And yeah, now we kind of have both come back home with our storytelling again. COVID made us kind of look around us once more locally and think, what can we do here? So the last few years, our stories shifted again to being local. And I think that's a kind of journey and pendulum that I think will continue to swing throughout our career. Um, the, The need to tell these vital stories locally, but also globally. I suppose quite as women, we seem to have magnetized towards telling women's stories because they feel more like stories that we can tell more authentically Um, and they span between the places which we feel at home at so that could be the ocean or the forest or on land where there's food growing, all of those different places where we feel at home. So we feel as though we can capture capture them in a way that feels very honest. And something else I just wanted to add, which kind of frames our work and goes back to the idea of hope is 
we grew up in an era where there was really extreme and kind of juxtaposing climate narratives and the way that climate films have been made almost up until this point until the last few years were kind of natural disaster ice caps melting coral reefs dying methane in the air cows you know but the george monbiot the environmental activist says that um you know some of these filmmakers failed to tell the greatest story of our time which is the human implications on the climate crisis and I think we with our stories want to challenge that whole mentality so to approach the story with the holistic intersectional perspective that we truly need in order to move forward and move forward together and move forward with the best intentions of all living and non-living <laughs> um species and stories can do that and they can connect people to another person's story on the other side of the world in this incredible way which can urge people to take action there and now and yeah they're powerful they're a powerful tool in reimagining the world that we want to live in i think you know a lot of art is like that, like this conversation, talking about it, imagining it. When you connect to a human story that is a very real and true experience that someone's been through and the experience that you've been through and the emotions that have come up in you whilst you've been watching a film or listening to a story, a human story, they are very real and I think we're moving as a kind of community of a species or whatever back to hopefully a more like emotionally driven place where we're connecting more to ourselves, we're connecting more to each other so it makes sense for us to be led with our work by emotion. I absolutely agree with you about the intersectional approach to climate action and finding those grassroots points of contact, the everyday people who can show us that we all can take action and inspire us. Um, I mean, you've, you've got this incredible film, Dive, Tierra Bomba Dive, which you have co-created and it's award-winning and it's telling the story of Yasandra Barrios, this young woman who emerges as a leader on her Colombian island to save the reef that's vital to their survival. And you're distributing this film alongside a really important and ambitious impact campaign to save the reef and secure the future of this community. So can you talk us through this project, how you came to learn of this in the first place and create this vital piece of storytelling? And what are your aims for the continued awareness and empowered action around the campaign? So going Dive Terra Bomba is a project that came about really so that tangent that I went on earlier about us going to South America for nine months is actually connected to this story because Luce and I spent about five of those months in Colombia um, on Las Islas Rosarios which is an archipelago in the Bay of Cartagena and we spent a lot of time with the locals kind of and the fishermen and walking along the beaches and seeing that the beaches were completely made of bleached dead coral the fishermen were going out in these tiny boats catching all kinds of fish not only kind of big edible meat fish but tiny little kind of tropical you know, not even edible reef fish. Um, and 
it was this kind of we saw this compounding crisis of social justice, environmental justice, um, and the the reason for this was because of the lack of support that the locals who live on these islands have from the Colombian government, and the reason that they were struggling was because they didn't have the resources that they needed to stand up and fight for the survival of the reefs that their lives depend on. And it's not only the imme- the life of the immediate coastal community who live on these islands, but it's also, you know, the global population beneath, beneath the sea and above on land. Um, but this story was just a microcosm and we saw it and we spent time with these people. And when we left, we said to ourselves, we were on the boat, we were like, we will go back and we will make a film to help this community. And that seed was planted. And then years later, we got offered by a commissioner to, to have to to pitch a film and Lucy started googling about the islands and came across this story of a young girl Yasandra Barrios standing up to protect her reef learning to dive and kind of bring that education and that visualization of the reef to the local fishermen and, and rally them and say hey look we need to stand up for our reef, we need to protect it, our lives depend on it, the food that we eat depends on it, and it's being destroyed and negatively impacted by the ships that pass every day, globalisation of unnecessary products being shipped across the world. Um, It's the corals, the ocean is heating, so the corals are being acidified and turning white and dying and this kind of multi compounding effects of why the reef around where they live was at risk. Um, And so we went back in this kind of crazy cyclical way. And that was a really amazing moment and Dive Cherubomba was born and maybe Luce, you could continue. Yeah. Um, What we always do with films is we spend however much time, as much time as possible with the characters without filming. So we build a relationship and trust that exists beyond the world of the film and beyond the camera, which is really vital, I think, to our work and to the intimacy that we've been able to create and capture. We worked with a really amazing couple who run a dive center from in in Cartagena. They're a really good communicator between the community and the outside world, and they were the people who set up the initiative for the youth of the island to be able to learn how to dive. So we kind of communicated with them the whole time. And since making the film, we have stayed a lot more in communication with them as we have been able to with Yasandra because of COVID and all the unforeseen circumstances that happen to you when you're a 19-year-old living literally on the edge of the world um, with no governmental help or infrastructure or anything like that. She wasn't in a position to take her dream further right now. Mm-hmm. But amazingly, we can continue to support Christine and Hotter, the couple who run the Dive Initiative, and they have set up an amazing project on the island, which is, is a community house where young people can go and they can learn about the reef and they can learn about diving and they can do their diving qualification if they want to. Um, and they can meet scientists and take 
learn how to do scientific research and take scientific samples. And so even though it was really upsetting for us to not be able to continue with Yasandra and supporting her specifically at this time, it almost became more poignant because she, her motivation and her interest inspired this whole movement because it inspired us to come to the island and it and by her allowing us to tell her story and her telling her story with us we were able to show the world why the island and the environment was so important and to raise money for this project now which um Christina and Hotta are doing so in a way Isandra has inspired so many other young people to follow in her footsteps and we've just just kind of caught up with um Christine and Hotter because we're re-releasing the film um on March the 18th on a are we allowed to say what yeah. yeah on Water Bear which is really exciting because the film initially was released with Red Bull and obviously they ha- have no interest in supporting any kind of environmental campaign in fact they try and steer as far away from that as they possibly can so it was quite a challenge for us to release it on that platform whilst running the campaign so we feel as though we have another kind of chance to a second win now so we're going to probably try and um do a second load of fundraising for the community house and um hopefully see more and more of the the young community of the island learn how to dive and um advocate protecting their reef and it really is so inspiring to see how like young people and I'm like young young teenagers can be like thought leaders for a whole community and i feel like we're seeing that more and more all over the world and that um telling isandra's story feels representative of a whole global movement of native led conservation that does exist but isn't necessarily represented I am so inspired. I think it's an incredible piece of story making and I really encourage anyone listening to this to go and check out all of Joya and Lucy's films. They're incredible, really worth um well, educating yourself on the topics that you're sharing with the world. And I'd love to chat about your recent project Climate Compost about soil for the land gardeners. I've been following Zach Bush and listening to him for a long time now and his organisation, Farmers Footprints. And it just makes complete sense to be looking at the healing of our soil first and foremost. So could you share with us what did you learn during this project? And yeah, what, how has your relationship changed with soil? I'm just mm-hmm. like, sorry, I'm just having a, like a mind flash to when we were trying to come up with some kind of like social media content about why we love soil. And we spent about an hour rolling around in the soil trying to take selfies of ourselves, like to, to create oh, yeah. some kind of visual, like and quite humorous, like slash candid photo for it. And we were love literally it. just like lying in the soil at Tinker's Bubble where we made another film of ours. And Joy was like, and I couldn't open my eyes because the sunlight was shining down on us. And Joy was like, you look like a mole. You have to open your eyes. We were like two moles coming out of a muddy, yeah. muddy mole hole. There, there's an amazing kind of comedic um, artist called David Trigley. He does amazing prints who you guys have probably heard of. And he did a piece the other day that just said, Soil is very, 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 very important forevermore. And I think that's a really good way of summing it up because to us, we can grow up and spend our whole life and not realise that the soil is a living entity. And I think that was what really both shocked and awe inspired me while we were making this film is as a living entity, it doesn't have the respect that it needs in order to do what it does best. Um, 
and we spoke to a soil scientist who said soil should have rights and it was such an interesting way of thinking about it as if you know we believe that animals should have rights and and plants why should the soil not be included within that um and i guess as this a huge surface of the earth we we completely take it for granted and yet 95% of food consumed is grown on soil um but the way that we are growing consuming and producing our food is killing the soil but it's not only killing the soil it's killing the animals that feed off the soil the water that pours into the rivers the humans that eat the food that's grown on the toxic soil and soil needs to be given life again to thrive if it's being killed by chemicals so it needs food and nutrients and looking after and i think it's a really hopeful time where there's a lot of education around why our soils are so degraded and why they're in such this state of urgent disrepair and what we can do to heal our soils and i think that human connection to soil us us wanting to heal our soils is also us wanting to heal ourselves um and the food that we put inside of ourselves a lot to talk about about soil but the the way that we found really was the most poignant and effective and personal way to us was to talk about the human story of soil um and that interconnection which doesn't treat soil as this thing that's over there but it treats it as something that we're deeply connected to. Yeah. Yeah, something we spoke about when we were working with the land gardeners is that like in ancient Chinese tradition you would eat a spoonful of soil if you were really ill or if you were hungover. And we we when when we saw the amazing compost that the land gardeners were making, we would like try and eat a spoonful of it and it, it it did feel like it felt right you know like it was so strange but it felt so right and of course we should be eating the soil like that it's full of billions of incredible microbes that have existed for hundreds of thousands of years and that our whole ecology is based upon if people want to learn about the food systems and what's wrong with them um but also about why we should have hope. Just listen to any Zach Bush thing you can get your hands on. Um, but we were so lucky because the land gardeners had connections to all these amazing people that we were able to interview. And Ratan Lau was also another really inspiring human that we had the chance to talk to. And he described it really well by saying that society is reflected basically by the soil that they live on and vice versa. I think the thing with soil is that, like Joya said, it, the essence of it can, in, on one hand, you could never even imagine describing soil and what it means in words because it's just like an infinite th- th- abandon of life and like spiritual sort of development over hundreds of thousands of years and but then at the same time it's simple because soil is life and that's a message that we just wanted to get get across in the film and a message that hopefully people begin to take on as as true and um and i guess it's quite overwhelming because you know, what What do we do when we feel like we're battling these hugely corrupted food systems that are run by mass corporations? What can we do? And I love how the land gardeners are actually doing something that 
is quite big scale for British agriculture. Like they are producing an incredible compost that's made from the nature of the land where it's the compost is going to be healing the soil so it like brings back this ecosystem it brings back compost into the ecosystem and then on an even even smaller scale we can have such a great impact and on the sort of movement towards healing the soil which is just eating organic whenever we can composting our own organic matter growing our own food and the best thing is is that all of that stuff heals us at the same time so and brings us joy and reduces anxiety i think that soil is hope yes i am right there with you I'm loving the visuals of both you rolling around in the soil. It sounds a lot like a rooted healing activity that we would do at one of our gatherings. Joya, you've shared a lot about food processes and practices and both of you around regeneration as a general theme. Can you give us a bit of a lowdown on what regeneration means to you and how might we all begin to engage with stories, practices and movements that amplify this path to reciprocity or what Robin Wall Kimura refers to as an honorary harvest? Yeah, she is an amazing writer. I think I absolutely loved her book, Braiding Sweetgrass. And I think that mentality of treading lightly and being very observant of the way that you behave and the impact that it has both kind of physically, spiritually, ecologically is so important. I talk about stories of regeneration because I think it comes from a kind of place of not really identifying with the word sustainability um, Mm. or conservation or these words that mean kind of to continue as we are but not to do much more um, to sustain. And I think we're in a multi-crisis, but one of them is our incapability to act because we're in a place of fear and paralysis, which is, I think, got a lot to do with the way that climate change has been spoken about in the media and it's created a paralysis in a lot of people. Um, So the stories of regeneration are there because we want to, and I want to, in terms of food and farming, highlight stories of people who are actively doing something to be in a better place than where we are now. Farming in a way that not, that doesn't just sustain, it um, feeds the soil, creates healthy, abundant food, creates a haven for wildlife and biodiversity, creates meaningful employment, um, nourishes the waterways. This, it has a kind of infinite, infinitely positive effect and That's in a way, you know, what Dive Tierra Bomba does. It's about ocean regeneration. It's about a community being empowered and having the tools that they need. So Yassandra can dive and see and value the reef and bring that education and that information to her community, to the fishermen, and they can then discuss that and rally together. And that's a kind of, it's not just a sustaining, it's a wanting to regenerate the reef and generate these conversations. Um, and that's where, yeah, regeneration kind of, what that means to me. I would just add that I think something that you are doing, which is really amazing, and that I guess we're also doing in our work, is 
the idea of regenerating is also about regenerating this idea and this visual that we have of like who a conservationist is or who a farmer is and um through joy working with the lamb workers alliance and through the stories we've found it's like part of regenerating the land is by a la- like creating the opportunity for all people from different backgrounds and different races and different communities and different classes, different ages to get involved in working the land or caring for the land. And I feel like that's something that we do in our work and Joya does in her photography independently too, is that it's about regenerating the image as well, which is so important. And only then will we begin real healing. Yes, I feel that if we really want to see change and act upon it, we do need those grassroots activists and change makers and ordinary people as our role models and not relying on instruction or lack of instruction and protocol from the people in power, for lack of a better phrase. I feel like you work a lot with amplifying younger voices. And I feel like this is where the hope is when I see younger people stand up and say, no, this isn't good enough. Young people who want to heal this world. And I'm curious if you have any reflections on working with the younger generations and maybe you can share a little bit about your documentary, Eve, as well. It's really great, isn't it, that in the last like couple of years, there has been much more of an uprising of children and young people with the youth climate activist movement. Um, So amazing um, that young people are educated and educating themselves about environmental issues and educating their parents about environmental issues and they are the future so of course they feel like they want to do something about it um and so when we met eve who at the time was a nine-year-old girl who had just moved to one of the oldest off-grid communities in England with her family, her mum, dad, her elder sister and brother, um, to live off-grid, having grown up in complete normality in North Devon. Um, we were like, wow, what an amazing, unique experience you're going through. And we met her at an open day of the off-grid community and everyone, all the adults were quite busy, as you are when you live off-grid, chopping firewood, growing food, harvesting food, um, all the different things. But Eve had all the time in the world to show us around the forest and we ran around after her, climbing trees and getting to know her. And at that point, we really had no idea. We had no kind of idea that we wanted to make a documentary in the community we just wanted to go and see how we felt when we when we were there but as soon as we met Eve and heard about what was going on in her life um i.e she had taken time off school and was deciding whether or not she wanted to go back into institutional education and also she was very much at the beginning of her journey becoming a young climate activist and we kind of met her at this really pivotal point in her life and thought well we should make a film about her it's almost like she had like a little angel arrived at our doorstep and wanted to share her story um so we did and um on the more Take bringing it back to your question a little bit more with young people standing up and protecting and getting involved in regeneration. Um, 
it was amazing because we had the opportunity to spend more time with her than we'd ever had in documentaries because she only lived an hour or so away from us. So we could see her life and her evolving over like a nine month period and we're still our friends and in contact with her now. So um, we definitely did see this really tangible thing happen where she had moved off grid and in a very like natural, childlike, playful, innocent way beca become completely enamored by the world around her, which was this forest. And through that forest becoming her world, her home, the thing that provided her, the thing, her playground, she naturally became really involved in climate activism. So that was really incredible because it just came from such a heartfelt place. Um, and in the film, you see her travel to London and she did an amazing speech after George Monbiot on one of the main stages at the last, one of the last Extinction Rebellion protests in London. And she was, it was amazing because she wasn't just getting up there and saying, you know, I live in a house and I don't know that much about anything, but I we should protect our planet. She was saying, I've moved off grid. I live somewhere where they haven't burnt fossil fuels for 25 years. And it's a completely bizarre experience for me, but this is what I've learned, that we need to protect our planet. Um, so it was just really moving and how lucky for us to be and know her at that time of her life and capture that experience that she had and see how she could become a role model for other kids. Um, we all have these really complex thought processes to go through in terms of like being someone that cares for the environment and for the planet, but also living a life where just the sheer nature of living, being alive is quite hypocritical because like it's really impossible to live a perfectly non-impactful life. And um, that seeing those kind of conflictions in a nine-year-old became a really amazing way for us all to reflect on our own lives in really beautiful ways nine-year-olds have more simple ways of looking at things but actually in that nature they are just the same very complex thought processes if that makes sense I think that is such a good thing to bring up I completely forgotten about that that we saw such um a contradiction and we can and we continue to as well in Eve but that is mirrored back at ourselves and I think every single person who's trying to change their behavior or think critically about the way that they're treading on the planet and Eve for example would be telling us about palm oil and how we shouldn't be eating palm oil but then asking us to buy her five packets of biscuits down at the <laughs> corner shop all containing palm oil or like um she was you know this an actual feral creature when we met her like covered in mud like leaves in her hair like ticks like the whole shebang <laughs> and like a cat woman and and then n now in the last few years I went to her birthday party the other day and she had like a kilo bag of sweets she was wearing a bodycon dress a plastic bum bag she was like you know be being like a really sassy plastic fantastic teenager and talking about all her boyfriends and girlfriends because she has so many of them and everything she's so superficially obsessed with. And it was, like, so fabulous just to see this, like, complete change in someone and how we can 
we all have the capacity just kind of to to be whoever we want and how important it is to let all of that come out and to laugh I guess to laugh at ourselves and be joyful and remember that things aren't just black and white and they're not linear and we need to not judge ourselves and others but everything's a conversation yeah I hope the film can offer a window into that imperfect world thank you for speaking to that because that's a huge topic and I feel it's often the paradox that we exist within that can sometimes prevent us from doing good or acting on change and I agree it's really important to dance with the irony and the complexity of what we're living in so As well as powerful storytellers yourselves, you're also often sharing wonderful resources and recommendations and snippets of information online. Um, So I just love it if you could share what's your most recent recommendations of whether that's reading, watching, listening, and what has been inspiring you in this moment. Oh, there's just so many books and films in the world. Sometimes I get a bit overwhelmed, especially also by words sometimes I try and write something down and then I just feel overwhelmed by how many words there are to express yourself and then decide not to write anything down um but I think films to do with food and farming um there's not enough of them but there's been some pretty good ones over the years and um food chains is a great one gather seed the untold story and and there's a patagonia one which i can't remember what it's called um and then fantastic fungi honeyland all kinds of great great films on on food systems and people growing food and looking at food in a critical way um and then some books that I've been looking into and reading recently specifically to do with this moment in time in this part of the world in the UK where we are is winter is such a reflective kind of heavy period where I think it's really hard not to become quite inward looking and internal. So I've kind of been trying to lean into that and read books about winter healing. So books like um, Why We Sleep, which kind of examines through quite a scientific lens all the reasons why we need sleep. And The Body Keeps the Score, which is about trauma within the body and if women rose rooted which is all about women finding their place on the land through mythic storytelling mythology and kind of how we have this um innate relationship to the land and that we need to re um re-establish it to be at our full potential and that's a really brilliant book um for kind of healing and that calling to the wild which sometimes we need to refind our place in the world um and there's one book that i'm really excited about reading called pleasure activism um by oh is it adrian marie brown i think so and it's all about whatever you do in your activism it's about looking for activism through a kind of intersectional lens but essentially whatever you do if it brings you joy then that's what you should be doing um and i think that's so vital and i've definitely been subject to that over the years acting from a place of fear rather than joy and i think I notice it in myself slipping back into that place. And I think 
you're not at your most receptive, emotional and impactful, I think, when you're acting from a place of fear. Um, so those kind of, I'm excited about that book for that reason, about what it's going to teach me. <laughs> I would just expand on that particular thing with fear. Have you listened to the um, Aubrey Marcus Sackbush podcast called like Beyond the Virus or something, Veronica? I've listened to every Zackbush podcast, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say because you'll lose your shit, but it's, I think it's quite recent, but that's really amazing two hours about just everything, but it always comes back to like how living and fear and guilt is like the root of all, so many of the problems that are going on right now and that like we really can and are rising above that but we just have to let ourselves. it was quite an experience really it was like a journey you know we are all storytellers you are all storytellers and that can be anything from having a chat with your neighbor in the morning or doing a podcast or writing a book or making a film or taking a photo anything and that we never underestimate the power of story which isn't original but I'll just come as the bearer of that message again I feel so grateful to have been able to find my voice as a storyteller because they truly are like the way that we navigate the world is the stories that we are told that we see you know billboard social media we're constantly receiving information and stories and i think we have to be really careful about what we choose to consume and mm. really listen to the way that that makes us feel in our body and our minds and then the way that that leads our behavior change um because there's you know there's too much out there right now to consume and i think that is why we tell the stories that we tell because we want to cut through all of that and always try and challenge um a conversation to make sure that we're saying something new and fresh from a new perspective that people that desperately need and want right now because of all of the other stuff that we're constantly being fed find joya and lucy's films at the right to and follow them on instagram at the right to roam films also joya's personal instagram is an amazing place of resource sharing and education so i recommend following her at joya barrow all links are in the show notes. I'm your host, Veronica Stanwell. You can find out more about our work, Rooted Healing, at rootedhealing.org. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>